The most alarming feature of the slavery controversy was the division that it caused between the North and the South over the question of slavery in the new territories. By 1818 or so, while most Northerners were accepting of slavery in the Old South, ex increasingly they were concerned over the spread of slavery into the American territories. In 1817, the, the territory of Missouri began to appeal to Congress for statehood. And at that point, the issue of slavery in the territories became a real thing. Many northern congressmen didn't want to see slavery move into Missouri, while most southern congressmen certainly did want to see the spread of slavery into the territories of the Louisiana Purchase. James Talmadge, a Democrat from New York, proposed that Missouri be admitted as a state under the condition that further admission to Missouri of slaves be prohibited and that all children born to slave parents be freed at the age of 25. The Talmadge Amendment ensured that Missouri would start out as a slave state but would gradually become a free state. In the House of Representatives, the Talmadge Amendment passed. The House had a slight majority of Northerners over Southerners. In the Senate, however, the amendment failed. From 1817 until about 1820, Congress was never able to reach a compromise over the question of Missouri. Would it become a slave state or would it become a free state? And then in eight, by 1820, Congress had managed to come up with a compromise over the question of Missouri. And this compromise is called the Missouri Compromise. It was settled in 1820 with a, uh, a, a series of policies that both sides were able to agree to. First, Missouri would be admitted as a slave state. Maine would be admitted at the same time as a free state in order to have a state of equality between the North and the South in the Senate. Slavery should be prohibited in all of the rest of the Louisiana Purchase Territory north of latitude 3630, except for Missouri itself. At the heart of the compromise was the assumption that there should always be a balance between free and slave states in the United States. Additionally, was the consideration that slavery could not or should not exist anywhere in the United States where cotton was not a major crop. 3630 latitude is a line above which people would have a difficult time growing cotton because the freezes would occur too early in the winter. Now, as this map shows, the compromise only applied to the Louisiana Purchase. Also, as it shows, the 3630 line would leave very little territorial space in the Louisiana Purchase for new slave states. <clears throat> that purple area right below the line called Arkansas Territory would be under this agreement about the only space left for slave states. Now, as I said, at the heart of the Missouri Compromise was the assumption that there should be a balance between free and slave states in the United States. So to maintain that balance, Missouri and Maine were admitted in 1820 and 21. Arkansas and Michigan were admitted as states in 1837. 
Florida and Iowa were admitted in 1845 and 46, and Texas and Wisconsin were admitted in 1845 and 48. When John Tyler annexed Texas in 1845, nobody was really prepared for that annexation. So it would take approximately three years from 1845 to 1848 to find a northern territory that was ready for statehood. And Wisconsin fit that bill. In 1846, David Wilmot, a Pennsylvania Democrat, introduced an amendment to a troop supply bill for the Mexican-American War. The resolution stated that since slavery was forbidden in Mexico, it should be barred from any territory that the United States acquired from Mexico. Wilmot triggered a bitter struggle in Congress. Once again, this amendment passed in the House, but was defeated in the Senate. In 1849, when California applied for statehood as a free state, Southerners threatened to leave the Union, led by our old friend John Calhoun and his friends in the South. Various solutions to the slavery question were proposed. Congress debated the question of California statehood and whether California would enter as a free or a slave state. Some Southerners recommended that it simply be cut in half and the Southern half enter as a slave state and the Northern half of California enter as a free state. Southerners wanted the Missouri Compromise Line to extend all the way to the Pacific. Some congressmen felt that the question of slavery should be left to the people of each territory, that they should be able to decide whether they would enter the Union as a free or slave state. The term for this is popular sovereignty, allow the people of the territory to decide. Some conservative congressmen both Northerners and Southerners, felt that the federal government was obligated to protect the property rights of American slaveholders no matter where they took their slaves, no matter where they tried to settle. Some Northern congressmen wanted slavery banned altogether in the new territory. As the debate wrangled on and the North and South grew more and more divided over the issue, Henry Clay stepped forward to try to propose a compromise, and this compromise was known as the Compromise of 1850. In January of 1850, Henry Clay introduced a series of resolutions all combined into one great big bill. Five of them finally became the basis for the settlement known as the Compromise of 1850. We've talked about this before, but I'd like to go over it again. The provisions were, first, California would be admitted as a free state. Second, the slave trade, but not slavery, would be prohibited in the District of Columbia. Third, Congress would enact a more effective fugitive slave law. Fourth, the public debt which Texas had acquired uh, uh, in, a, in the 1836 Texas Revolution would be paid by the United States. Next, Texas would give up all claims to territory in what would become New Mexico and Utah. And finally, territorial governments in New Mexico and Utah might determine for themselves, might use popular sovereignty to decide whether they would be free or slave states. Not surprisingly, 
extremists on both sides opposed the compromise. Pro-slavery congressmen like John Calhoun and anti-slavery members of Congress like uh, William Seward of New York and Salmon Chase of Ohio, both abolitionists, condemned the compromise. But on the whole, Clay's compromise was supported. Moderate Northern and Southern politicians insisted that the Compromise of 1850 provided a final, equitable settlement to the problem. Of course, they were wrong. Several factors led to the disruption of the Compromise in the late 1850s. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 angered anti-slavery groups in the North. Southern interests continued to try to secure additional slave territories. In 1848, President Polk tried to purchase Cuba. If purchased, it would have become a slave territory, but the Spanish quite simply refused to sell. Pro-slavery interests expanded into Oklahoma, Kansas, and other territories in hopes of making those states slave states at some point in the future. But the most fateful factor in the undoing of the Compromise of 1850 and the Missouri Compromise was the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Now, the act was engineered by Stephen Douglas, a senator from Illinois and a Democrat, uh, and he was interested in having a transcontinental railroad go from New York to California, and most important, stop in his home city of Chicago. Remember, again, Douglas is from Illinois. Douglas, for that reason, introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Bill in 1854 to make the extension of a transcontinental railroad easier. Now, here's the problem. If the railroad went through Chicago and continued west, it would have to go through territories that, while a part of the United States, were primarily controlled by the Sioux Indian Nation. It was their hunting grounds in Kansas and Nebraska. In order for the railroad to travel through those territories, the Sioux would have to be pacified. There would have to be a military presence in Kansas and part of Nebraska. And Douglas saw that the only, re only means by which this could be accomplished would be to try to get them into the Union, organize them, get them into the Union as quickly as possible. So Douglas introduced the Kansas-Nebraska Bill. He proposed the creation of two new territories, Kansas in the South and Nebraska in the North. In order to try to sell both Southern and Northern members of, members of Congress on the deal, Douglas said that Nebraska, the larger territory in the North, would enter as a free state once it was organized, or perhaps more than one free state. Kansas, on the other hand, in the South, would enter as the people of Kansas decided. That is, uh, the people of Kansas could exercise popular sovereignty. Once the, the, the territory was organized and the people of Kansas decided to, to become a state, they could decide whether they would enter as a free state or a slave state. Now, the reason he did this was to butter up Southern members of Congress who saw Kansas as an opportunity under this bill to enter as a slave state. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act had a little something, a little treat for everybody in it, and that's how Douglas hoped that he could get it passed. Now, 
Now, Douglass had no real moral convictions against slavery. Uh, he believed that the most democratic method of determining whether a state should be slave or free was to let the people of the state or territory decide. The idea, as we've seen, is called popular sovereignty. Douglas proposed that the people of Kansas Territory should be allowed to determine for themselves whether Kansas would become a slave or a free state when it entered the Union. Douglas's bill caused a firestorm of opposition because it allowed slavery north of the line agreed to in the Missouri Compromise, effectively repealing it. Even before the bill passed, a new grassroots opposition party was being organized in most northern states, the Republican Party, which we'll look at uh, later. Northern Democrats, Southerners, some Westerners, and President Franklin Pierce supported the bill. The bill passed in May of 1854. It was signed into law by uh, President Pierce. Uh, Pierce was a doe face, uh, or northerner, whose political support came mostly from the South. In effect, there were now three political positions in American politics represented by northern Democrats led by Douglas, northern Republicans, and by southern Democrats. In 1860, they each, as we're going to see, would run a candidate for president of the United States. The political results of the Kansas-Nebraska Act were far-reaching and, to some extent, catastrophic for the political system in the United States as it existed at the time of its passage. Here are some of the results of the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. First, the division of the Whig Party into Northern Whigs, who repudiated the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and the pro-slavery faction of the Whig Party, who would come to be known as the Cotton Whigs. Northern Whigs would be called Conscience Whigs, and Southern Whigs would become Cotton Whigs. This created a rift between the Northern and Southern Whig Party, that would never really be mended. Second, the anti-Nebraska Democrats, or the Northern Democrats, uh, are many of them anyway, many Northern Democrats left their party in protest over the bill. Some of them joined the Conscience Whigs and the Free Soil Party and would ultimately move into the Republican Party. As the two major political parties broke up, a third party, the American or Know Nothing Party, opposed, uh, enjoyed a very brief period of success. The Know Nothings completely ignored the slavery issue and called for the exclusion of new foreign immigrants. Finally, the Kansas Nebraska bill opened up the emergence of a new political party in the United States, the Republican Party. The most significant political development of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and its passage was the formation of a completely new and largely regional northern political party, the Republicans. Republicans were recruited from the ranks of free soilers, anti-slavery Whigs, and northern Democrats. The party opposed the extension of slavery into any new territories of the United States. Worse still, or as bad, I should say, I guess, was the what happened in Kansas. The principle of popular sovereignty that Douglas had written into the Kansas-Nebraska bill was put to the test in the Kansas Territory. Anti-slavery and pro-slavery interests began to send forces into Kansas to support the various sides with both warm bodies and bullets. 
many pro-slavery Missouri residents called border ruffians rode across the border into Kansas, heavily armed and prepared to support their pro-slavery principles with guns. Several anti-slavery organizations in the North, most notably the New England Immigrant Aid Campaign, organized and funded several thousand settlers to move to Kansas and establish free state settlements, that is pro uh, or anti-slavery settlements, in Topeka, Manhattan, and Lawrence, Kansas. Abolitionist preacher Henry Ward Beecher collected funds to arm like-minded settlers with Sharps rifles, leading the precision rifles to become known as Beecher's Bibles. By the summer of 1855, approximately 1,200 New Englanders had made the journey to the new territory, armed to the teeth and ready to fight. The pro-slavery Kansans elected a majority of the territorial legislature in 1855 and established a government in Shawnee Mission. In response to the pro-slavery majority legislature, a free soil group held a convention at Topeka, Kansas, and framed a second constitution that banned slavery in the territory. And after all this, Kansas exploded into violence. On May 21st, 1856, a group of border ruffians entered the free state stronghold of Lawrence, Kansas, massacred citizens and burned much of the town to the ground. In retaliation, John Brown led a group of men on an attack at a pro-slavery settlement at Pottawatomie Creek. The group dragged five pro-slavery men and boys from their homes and hacked them to death with broadswords. In 1856, the official territorial capital was moved to Lecompton, a, can, a town only 12 miles from Lawrence. In April of 1856, a three-man congressional investigating committee arrived in Lecompton to look into the troubles. The majority report of the committee found the elections to be in. Uh, improperly influenced by border ruffians. The president failed to follow any recommendations of the committee, however, and continued to recognize the pro-slavery legisla legislature at Lecompton as legitimate government of Kansas. In fact, on July 4th, Pierce sent federal troops to break up an attempted meeting of the shadow government of anti-slavery citizens in Topeka. In August, thousands of pro-slavery Southerners formed into armies and marched into Kansas. The same month, Brown and several of his followers engaged 300 pro-slavery soldiers in the Battle of Osawatomie. The headlines raged for another two months until Brown departed the Kansas Territory, and a new governor, John W. Geary, took office and managed to prevail on both sides for peace. Even after Geary was able to manage a sort of an insecure truce, he managed to uh, gain only a fragile peace, which would still be broken intermittently with violent outbreaks for nearly the next two years. 
By 1856, the Union was divided. The national political parties that had provided cohesion to a nation prone to fracture were broken, and little remained to keep the peace. It's at this time that a new northern regional political party appeared, born out of the conflict over slavery and territorial expansion, this new party was the Republican Party.